Well, hey there, one and all online. I'm so glad that you're here to watch week two of our Pursuing Jesus series, where we're gonna be going back to the basics, talking about what it means to know God and specifically knowing God here at One and All. If you haven't joined our Discord server yet, that is the best place for you to join an online community from wherever you are around the world. It's a great place to talk about videos just like these with other people who are also watching each and every week. You also have an opportunity to join an actual community group at One and All by visiting One and All Dot church slash community. We have groups of people that meet from all around the world in an online fashion on Zoom and other mediums. You want to check it out. There's a group waiting for you. And if there isn't, you need to lead a group. We also want to encourage you before we hop into this video, if you haven't yet subscribed and you're watching on YouTube, or maybe you're watching on our website, head over to our YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button. Also hit the like button, leave a comment. I would love to interact with you on there and share this video with a friend, somebody else that needs to get back to the basics and learn the fundamentals of what it means to know God. We also have some really cool young adult content coming out this week. So you're going to want to make sure that you're subscribed so that if you're 18 to 30 year old, anywhere around the world, you're going to participate with us for one and all young adults. Let's get into the service now. Welcome to One and All Church, everybody. My name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors on the team here. And yes, I am sporting my Dodger blue, Go Ian. Giants. Go <laughs> Giants. Hey, as of this filming, currently, yeah, the Giants are in first place. But it doesn't really matter who's in first place right now. It matters who's in first place at the end of the season. And if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure those Dodgers took home a ring last year. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> hey, if you happen to be new around here, then we want to connect with you. And you can help us by heading to oneandall.church slash new. Give us just a little information about yourself and we will follow up and help you in taking some next steps and how you can get connected here at One and All Church. But today, Ian, we got something very special in store. Pursuing Jesus week two. Week two, man. And I believe that Jeff is back from his uh, study break as well. So oh, it's, it's going to be so good. It's good. Whenever Pastor Jeff comes back from a study break, you know it's yeah. going to be He's going to be refreshed. So it's going to be good. Yeah. Now, it, also, before we head into the message, you want to make sure to download the One and All app. It's newly designed. Got some great great features and you can do that by simply heading to the app store and typing in one and all church download that app you can take message notes there's a whole discipleship process in there that you can participate in make sure to download that app it's really going to help you in this series as we pursue Jesus together yeah I love the app it makes it so much easier in the service you can take your notes download them and just have them on the go it's perfect all right well let's go for it guys week number two knowing God Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 6. We're going to get there just in a moment. In Matthew 6, Jesus makes a rather dramatic statement. Uh, before I get to that, I, I just want to preface what I'm going to say with these words. Everything I'm going to teach, everything I'm going to say in this message, I'm guilty of it all. We all are. So I don't want you to get the, the feeling that I'm here to present you with this attitude or lifestyle that I am living perfectly, and if you could just become like me, everything will be good. The opposite is true, in that I struggle with these very same things. So I know the ramifications, but the reality is all of us should be trying to improve at these areas. And the simple way of saying it is that the way most of us are living is just not working. It's not conducive to human flourishing. It's definitely not conducive to a healthy spirituality. It's, it's, it's detrimental uh, to hearing the voice of God, and hearing the voice of God is everything. When you're in a position where you can discern the voice of God, the words of God to you, then you gain guidance 
during crucial times when you face crucial decisions. Uh, you're going to be able to feel encouragement when you feel like giving up. You're going to experience a certain amount of certainty when everything that you've believed in all of your life, you start to doubt, you begin to doubt. What Jesus says, again, is very dramatic. He says in Matthew 6, verse 22 and 23, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness indeed? We're in a series called Pursuing Jesus. Let me build this kind of platform upon which we are going to continue to present truths associated with what happens when we pursue Jesus together as individuals coming together, corporate body of Jesus Christ, and as a church. The idea that Jesus is presenting here has to be seen through the lens, no pun intended, of the ancient world. In the ancient world, there was a quasi-science uh, called physi uh, uh, physiognomy. And basically, this science taught that a person's physical features could communicate the type of person they were on the inside. As a matter of fact, Hippocrates said, those with a large head and large dark eyes and a wide stub nose are honest. So you see how this works? Your physical features determine who you are on the inside. Now, I read that and I thought, wow, I have a small head. In fact, when I buy hats, I have to buy a child size, large in a children's size. I have light blue eyes and my nose is quite narrow, which means according to Hippocrates, I must be dishonest. Cicero said, the eyes are the chief indicator of the soul. The color and shape of a person's eyes reveal with exceeding clarity the innermost feelings of our hearts. There is a first century description of Tiberius that goes like this. His unusually large eyes remind one of cattle and therefore a sign of sluggishness. So in the eyes of who, or, or the, the, the person who's writing about Tiberius, his face looked like a cow, therefore he must be lazy. As a matter of fact, we have a few terms that have evolved out of that first century context. For instance, you and I use the term stink eye. Well, that evolved from the idea of evil eye. And the belief was that certain animals or individuals, demons or gods, had the power to injure any object on which their glance fell. So Plinius the Elder wrote about the evil eye of a certain tribe when he said, there are families in the same part of Africa that wield the evil eye, whose gazes cause meadows to dry up, trees to wither, and infants to perish, who also injure by the evil eye and who kill those at whom they stare for a longer period of time, especially with furious eyes. So imagine having that kind of power just by staring to cause physical debilitation. Now, the reason that's important is because that is the context into which Jesus speaks his words. If the eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness indeed? The Hebrews had reversed the order. In fact, invented the order. And saying that the eyes do not necessarily reveal the character of a person. Rather, that upon which the eyes gaze reveals what the person's heart is ultimately about. And will also have deep ramifications of mental health. So rather than the eyes revealing the character of a person, as was the thought among those who were in the quasi-science uh, physiognomy, the Hebrews taught that what the eyes shine light on, what the eyes gaze upon, what they fix their focus on, in turn reveals what a person's heart pursues or chases hard after, and as a result has great impact on our physical and mental health. Let me read it again. He says, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if your gaze is on something that is healthy, something that is good, something that has been designed for human flourishing, then you in turn will be healthy. But if you fix your gaze through your entire life on those things that are of darkness, those things that are unhealthy, those things that can never deliver what your soul searches for most, then darkness will be, 
or re- will reside and great will be the darkness indeed. Now back to the way that you and I are living as we began this message. I just got back from Turkey. It's not what I expected at all. I'd never been, I had read stories, I had seen documentaries. This is a very slow paced culture. In fact, people sit out in the parks and on the street side cafes till late in the hours of the night, somewhere around midnight. The men and the women of the community come together in groups and they play backgammon. They drink Turkish tea or Turkish coffee. They eat this thing called cement, uh, not cement, but cement, which is like uh, our form of the bagel, only much more narrow, much more crisp. They talk every evening. They enjoy life. The shops don't even open till 10 a.m. And the reason they don't open till 10 a.m., which was uh, quite a struggle for me because I need coffee before seven or things get ugly. So I couldn't get a coffee until 10 or 10.30 because even though they open the shop at 10, you can come in and sit down, but nothing really starts till around 10.30 or 11. And the reason this is, is because they live their lives in community till late in the evening. They sleep in and then start their day around 10 o'clock. Service in Turkey is non-existent. So if you go in and you order a latte, which I did many times, and you stand there waiting as if you want to take it, you want to get it to go, they will look at you and they will say respectfully, but in their broken English, they will say, no, no, sit down, you sit down. Because in their minds, if you're going to order a latte, a latte is meant to be enjoyed. You don't take it and run away with it, but you sip it slowly and enjoy the day. One day when we were in a village called Selçuk, I was walking down the street to try to find an ATM. As I'm walking, of course, an American tourist stands out. There was an older man, a Turkish man by the name of Marco, who owned a carpet shop. And as I walked by him, knowing that I was out of place, he said, where are you from? In his broken English. I responded by saying Los Angeles. He said, come, sit with me. Let's talk. I know that you're an American. And Let me share the simplicity of Turkish life with you. And in about a 40-minute conversation, I mean, I I found this to be a divine uh, intervention that I would have the opportunity to speak with someone that knew enough English that I could gain or glean from him everything I could about Turkish culture. And during the course of the evening, our conversation went on a more deep level. He started saying to me, as he trusted me, you Americans, he said, are killing yourselves. Now here's a Turkish man who has spent about three or four years in Los Angeles and then moved back to his home. He said, in America, you never have enough. And you think you're very religious, but you're not. Now, give him a little grace here. He comes from a place where five times a day, the Amman comes over the loudspeakers in every city throughout Turkey. And no matter where you are, you either come to the mosque to pray or you get your carpet or mat out in the street or at your job, wherever you are, and you pay homage to your God. He says, but you Americans are far too busy to be religious, far too busy to give thanksgiving to your God. And I thought, wow, imagine America doing that, where we would ring the church bell maybe three times a day. What would happen? We'd probably be Uh, arrested for disturbing the peace, but how many Americans would stop what they're doing three, four, five times a day and just engage in a pleasurable conversation with God and with each other? Now, he wasn't being critical. He was just stating, and I think an effort to get me to move to his country, that for us Americans, life is all about opportunity. He's right about that. We are the land of opportunity. And there's a part of me that got a little defensive because I'm thinking, hey, you know what? People don't move to Turkey to make a career. They move to America. But that was exactly his point. In his own Turkish way, he was explaining to me how the pendulum in America has swung too far, that we don't live simple lives anymore. And it's robbing us of enjoying every new day. Everything in America, I thought, is high speed, high speed internet. You want your iPhone to work faster and faster, which is why you pay more and more money. We think of the money we spend on high tech, on things like Amazon and eBay, places where we can order things and have them at our front door within a matter of hours. And how about Netflix and Apple and Disney and Hulu? We want the convenience of things operating fast. We have cars and houses. We pay $5 for a cup of coffee. And sometimes when I hear someone say, I'm just trying to pay the bills, 
I'm reminded, yes, it's because most of us live far above our means. And the things we purchase, we really don't truly need. The properties that we have. I looked at my own house and I'm thinking, the house I live in, most people would say, where are the other four families who live with you? And if someone in Turkey were to see three cars in my driveway, they'd probably say, why do you need three cars? Or why don't you just take the bus? You notice what Jesus talks about in that passage in Matthew 6? I read the part with which most of us are not familiar. We are familiar with the preceding verses where Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The point of all of this is there is a high cost to the way that we are living. And it's not just money. Jesus said the pursuit of mammon and wealth changes you. It changes what you pursue. You become a different person. And what you pursue all of your life ends up pursuing you. And what you're trying to get ends up trying to get you. And my Turkish friend was trying to explain to me that this is literally, this kind of life is killing us. And it's why we are so anxious and depressed and have a sense of hopelessness. You know, there's a, there's a neat little trick that you play on yourself when you experience anxiety disorder, which many Americans are. It's a thing called biofeedback. So as your brain is sending a message to your body defined as impending doom, and your heart is racing and your pulse is firing, and your blood pressure rises, if you just take your fingers and put them where your pulse is, just under your neck here, and you take four deep breaths, your pulse will slow. It will send a signal to your brain that your pulse is slowing, therefore everything must be okay, and you'll get it out of the circle of impending doom into the circle that I'm okay. I wish I knew a trick to tell you that you could put your soul to rest, but that doesn't come by some trick or some formula. That comes when you make intentional change in your life. And according to Jesus, the change resides primarily in what you have decided all of your life to fix your gaze upon. Let me read it again. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, if you fix your gaze on things that are conducive to spiritual and mental health, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, if you fix your gaze on things that will never deliver what your soul most search for, searches for, then your whole body will be full of darkness. Again, this series that Steve launched so well last week is about healthy eyes healthy bodies full of light, healthy souls experiencing shalom, peace, human flourishing, that we are fixing our eyes on Jesus together, that as a community and as individuals that we may know God and experience his presence in our lives. So what this sermon then tends to do, intends to do, is to address the question of how to. How do I then, if I am to pursue Christ, if I am to fix my gaze on God, and that will bring about a healthy spirituality, a healthy mentality, that my life is full of light, shedding away the darkness, human flourishing, shalom, then how do I go about that? Now, quickly, I hardly ever ask you to write anything down. Follow in your, bullet, or follow in your uh, outline on the app or write these principles down. They're important. Some of them you've heard before, some of them not. First one is this. You pursue Christ. We pursue Jesus together through the language of God and his revelation to us. There have been numerous times in my marriage when my wife Robin has said this to me, and I'm sure many wives have said the same thing to their husbands. How can you and I be close if we seldom talk? You can't. How can we be intimate with each other when you don't understand me? And how can you understand me when there's no effort of communication, deep, meaningful communication? The Bible tells you that God has gone to great lengths to communicate with you his will, his purpose, his way, in a way that you can comprehend. It's called the Bible. God's story of redemption, of hope, and ultimate security are all found in the pages of Scripture. And if you're seldom in the Word, you cannot possibly experience Jesus. Pursuing Jesus means that you're wanting to hear from his revelation. You're wanting to understand him. Chris T. Green, one of my favorite devotional authors, because 
I believe that he has great depth and he writes with such profundity. He says in one of his excerpts, God's relationship with human beings is the, in the pages of Scripture and throughout history, as well as the very existence of the Bible, gives ample evidence that God guides, instructs, corrects, inspires, encourages, reveals, and more. Inspired writers even call him the Word. The Word of God and the character and the workings and doings of God are inextricably tied together so that the more you're aware of the way God works, the more ability you have to discern the voice of God. God has always been vocal and he always will be, but you have to position yourself to listen and to hear. David said early in the morning, well, I seek thee, Psalm 63, one. He also said in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. James chapter four, verse eight says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I had the privilege in my young life of having a grandmother, Grandma Bessie, who exemplified this type of life. She didn't have a lot financially. Her gaze, her constant pursuit was that of God through the voice of Scripture. And she constantly heard from the voice of God as a result. She didn't have a television. She couldn't afford it. She didn't have an internet, no iPad, no iPod, no iPhone. As we've said in the past, just I prayed. And as she prayed... Even though she had plenty of outward struggles, diabetes, poverty, she had lived uh, or surpassed the lives of two husbands, yet she had this unbelievable strength and faith. And I remember going to see her and witnessing firsthand this tattered old Bible that she would sit and hold and quote, even after her eyesight was gone, she believed the word of God became flesh and was her connection to God in Christ. So she poured over Scripture, the written word, probably like Martin Luther poured over the passage, the just shall live by faith. Because the words of Scripture became her lifeline, her power, her security. Charles Spurgeon said, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. And James Merritt said, the primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but to know God. Can I tell you, there's no shortcut here. And for those of you who think you know God and spend no time in the Word, be very careful. The God you're beginning to know may not be the God of Scripture. It requires heavy pursuit. And it's taken me a long time, a lifetime, to see how my daily time with God can pay huge dividends. When you're feeling worthless, the Spirit recalls Jeremiah 1.5 and Psalms 139. Before you were born, I formed you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. When you feel distant from God, God is a friend who stays closer than a brother, Proverbs 18, 24. When you feel lost and alone, Ephesians 2, you've been saved by grace through faith. When you feel unloved, nothing can separate you from the love of God, Romans 8, 39. When you feel abandoned, God will work everything together for good, for his good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So first, the language of God now, let me go back. I'm going to uh, stay here just for a moment. You and I want to pick up the Bible, read something, and magically be changed. So when we hear this, we think, I'll try that for a week. We do it. It makes little sense to us. And so we give up. You cannot approach the Bible as if somehow it's a quick fix. In the same way that I can't repair any damage in my marriage with one conversation. It takes an investment in understanding the language of the person that you are pursuing. The Bible, you must study it. You must seek to understand it. You must meditate upon it. And you must pray that the Spirit activate the right word at the right time. And because we are not living simple lives, my Turkish friend is right. We are far too busy fixing our gaze on competing forces that are making our souls dark. We are distracted by the affluence of the Western way. So we engage in Netflix and Hulu and Facebook and Apple TV and Snapchat and Twitter and news outlets and TikTok. And I'm not anti those things. I'm simply saying, do you invest as much time in pursuing Jesus as you do fixing your gaze on things that make no significant contribution to your spiritual and mental health? 
through the word and the language of God. Second, you pursue Christ. We pursue Christ together when we live a more simple life and we pursue Jesus through the language of friends. I don't think most of us realize the power of community and friendship because if we did, we would invest more time in community. I've noticed in my own life, the language of friends can keep us centered, increase our ability to know Jesus in a way that grants us incredible power over temptations, emotions, and doubts. In fact, God has often spoken his best words into my life through the voice of a friend. You know, while I was in Turkey, I received a call uh, from the uh, president or from the CEO director of what is known as ICOM, International Conference on Missions. And I hadn't heard from David for a while. And I was kind of shocked when he said, look, the board and I met together a couple of nights ago and we all agreed we'd like you to speak in the Friday night session. Now, you have to know something. Usually the convention is planned out years ahead of time. The speakers are advertised. We know who's going to do what a couple of years, three years ahead of time. Now, the convention, ICOM, which hosts about eight to 10,000 people every year, it's an annual convention, is about six weeks away. So I asked David, I said, why, why would you be calling me now to ask me to speak in perhaps what is the most popular session, the Friday night session? And he, here was his answer. And I, you know, I really stressed on whether to mention this and I think it's time to do so. David said, because there are so many wondering about your relationship with Ravi Zacharias. And there are so many people who are wondering what happened and do you have any answers for us? Now at first hearing that, I thought, man, I don't want anything to do with this. And then when I heard his plea, he said, the next generation need to have some kind of explanation or some kind of understanding how such a great man of great wisdom could have lived such a duplicitous life. I put down the phone and I started to do some research. I thought, well, better now than, than never, I guess. Something to force me to really deal with this. Can I tell you something about my dear friend? My dear friend got to the point where he was totally isolated. There was no accountability around him. He was respected and revered to such a high degree that no one asked him the hard questions. About 20 years ago, he started to live outside of community. He was so well known, he could be in the midst of hundreds of thousands of people, but never really close proximity to anyone. As I talked to people that I knew who knew him, traveled in the same circles, it is very clear the beginning of the demise occurs when we isolate ourselves thinking that we are strong enough to make it on our own. In the last couple of years, we have had the great fall of great churches who have done great ministry in America. We've had the destruction or demise of Mars Hill that was led by Mark Driscoll. We've had Willow Creek and everything that happened there in Chicago under the direction and leadership of Bill Hybels. And I do not stand here judging those men, but simply to say, the commonality in all falls seems to be isolation, where the leader positions himself in a place where nobody can truly get to him or her. There is a lack of community. And the commonality in the great falls seems to be, I can live life on my own. I need no one to ask me the hard questions. And I am above giving an answer to anyone for my actions. Alternatively, as I continued the research, I discovered wonderful things about other great communicators. Chuck Swindoll, Billy Graham, Matt Chandler, Rick Warren, Francis Chan, all refuse to live outside community. They understand that without community and accountability, there's no way they're going to become all they can become in Jesus Christ. And greater still, they have a great recognition, an uncanny ability to recognize that if you're not moving toward Christ, there's no such thing as stagnation, you're moving backward. It's impossible to remain stable. You're either going forward in your relationship or you're being sucked into the vortex of the world and moving backwards. So can I ask you, who speaks into your life? You say, Jeff, I really don't need that. Dude, you're the one who needs it the most and your arrogance will ultimately be your downfall. Because the truth is, 
Feeling, experiencing Jesus comes as the result of a decision to position yourself in the places where his voice is heard most loudly. And the voice of God is heard most loudly in the word of God and the discipline that you maintain, studying the word of God, reflecting on the word of God, and the words of mature friends. You say, Pastor Jeff, how do I know they're mature? They often disagree with you. They know the word of God well and they use scripture rather than pop psychology when you need their advice. And they not only pray with you, they pray for you. There's no shortcut here. It really comes down to upon what am I fixing my gaze? What do my eyes pursue? And pursuing Jesus involves positioning myself around Christian friends who will carry my burdens And in this way, thus fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6. Folks, it's friends, our friends, who will help us discover the difference between feeling sorry that we have violated God's word and actually repenting with a strong intention never to do it again. How do we pursue Jesus? The language of God, the language of friends, quickly, the language of obedience. When Moses asked for a sign, even he in his doubt said, God, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to deliver your people, give me a sign that you will deliver me. Do you remember God's response? It's something we've dealt with numerous times. God did not say to Moses, just wait till I show up and part the Red Sea. Just wait till I show up and manifest myself in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Just wait till you step in front of the burning bush. He never said that. He simply said, Here is how you're going to know that I will deliver you. In Exodus 3, 12, he says, and this will be the sign that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. He said, Moses, if you want to know, if you want a sign, here's the sign. Obey me every step of the way. And when you obey me, you will know that you are in right standing with me. And I promise you, you will feel my presence in a very deep and meaningful way. And you will know that you can trust me, that I will be faithful in the promises I have given. We have lost our ability to feel Jesus because we've lost our willingness to obey him. Are you with me? Say, Pastor Jeff, I've heard you say that before, but do you know that the greatest adventures of your life, the most intense victories of your life, the most valuable pursuits of the soul, Begin when you, with the help of a friend, obey the hard word that God has given you? Do you understand the reason so many of us are stuck and we're not moving forward? That we've known Jesus in this way for quite some time now and it's like we can't get past the elementary things? That we say in our hearts that we seek a deeper, more intimate relationship with God and yet we've never put two and two together? And ask the question, why are we not advancing? Why are we not existentially experiencing God on a level that we never have previously? And it's because there is an area of disobedience in your life. And you know it. A voice keeps telling you, rationalizing this area of disobedience that the Spirit of God keeps convicting. But then another voice comes in and says, Everyone has this problem. You're no different. You know, I just had a young girl say to me that she's been dating this young man who is a youth pastor. And she said, Pastor Jeff, I don't want know what to do. I really like him. He's got an addiction to pornography. And I asked him if he's willing to deal with this. And he said, look, everybody struggles with this. You're just going to have to live with it. She said, what do I do? I said, run, uh, run as fast as you can. We hear this voice telling us that this area that we're living in disobedience, grace will cover this. God understands my struggle. But you're missing the bigger question. Do you want to limp your way into eternity with God or do you want to thrive in this life and run to him in the next? And more importantly, I think, do you want to be used by God for grand purposes while experiencing the best adventures of your life. Your best life now is always on the other side of obeying the hard word God has given to you. As we pursue Christ together, 
as we fix our gaze and our eyes on him, we gain these disciplines whereby we want to study and understand the communication, the word of God to us, where we are held accountable through Christian friends and where we are willing to obey him in the difficult areas of life. So who has the courage this weekend? Who has the real courage to stop pursuing and watching and listening inappropriate content? Darkness in, darkness out. Fix your gaze on things detrimental to the soul. The soul becomes unhealthy and begins to disintegrate. Ephesians chapter five, verse one, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now listen to verse three. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. The alternative is that you would fix your gaze or set your minds on things above, Colossians 3, 2. Who has the courage now to ask yourself the hard question? What do I fix my gaze on? What motivates me? What gets my heart pumping a little faster? What am I most passionate about? How many of us would be willing to walk out of here or turn off YouTube or whatever we're watching and after this message is over, say, I'm gonna stop the affair. I'm gonna stop the greed. I'm gonna stop the coveting. I'm gonna stop the crude language. I'm gonna stop being entertained by things that Jesus would most definitely disapprove of. I'm gonna stop the gossip and the slander. I'm gonna stop the bitterness and unforgiveness. We have lost our ability to feel Jesus because we've lost our willingness to obey him. We can't feel him because we refuse to obey. And because we can't feel him, we start to doubt his existence. And because we doubt his existence, we have no access to the power within us that he is more than willing to release to give us the greatest victories of our lives. It's all connected. How do we pursue Jesus? Listen to the language of God. Listen to the language of friends. Listen to the language of obedience. Fourth and finally, stay with me now. Listening to the language of worship. Let me tell you something that happens as you get older. Music plays a greater role of consolation and inspiration than we ever dare admit. Because over time, your heart gives way to certain cries the cry for peace and tranquility, the search for solace, the cry for a touch of the supernatural, for something that penetrates deep into the soul. And I am convinced that more than ever, music has the capacity to strike at the core of our beings in a way that God has designed from the beginning. In other words, if you want to pursue Jesus in a meaningful way, you've got to make worship a regular part of your day. You know, some of you have heard me say before that Spotify may not be from God per se, but like every other secular invention, we Christ followers are called to redeem it for good. And can I tell you what I do? I try to listen to one and all worship songs as I'm driving down the road, I love to listen to Joshua Aaron, especially his concert Live at the Tower of David. He's a favorite artist of mine. I love Elevation Worship, especially the song, Oh, Come to the Altar. I've shared that before. Worship has a way of bringing God who seems far near. Now, I do not want to regurgitate everything I've said about my time in Rwanda. I just know that we still have new people coming all the time. So just a short explanation. After the genocide in 1994, I was one of a few pastors that went into the prisons of Kigali, actually all throughout the country of Rwanda, to preach the message of repentance. And Kugami, the president, 
uh, in the same vein as Nelson Mandela decided that he would seek, uh, rather than seek retribution, would seek reconciliation. And part of that was the repentance of the people who had orchestrated the genocide. Remember, you're talking about a, a million people died within 90 days. Now, I had been to Rwanda on numerous occasions, but on this particular occasion, my translator, Anastas Abamuga, told me that we were going to go up on the border of the Congo. Now, I want to tell you a little bit of the rest of that story. I've given you the big picture, but let me go down to the weeds a little bit for a second. I had prepared the message that I was going to preach, and this was going to be a hostile crowd. I've shared with you that I said to Anastas right before we entered through the iron gates, I said, am I in any danger? Remember his response? Does it matter? If you're in danger, you're not going to preach the gospel to these people? Are you only going to go in if it's safe? I go in, and there's a real part of me that did not want to go. Robin was not with me. I, was, I felt alone, although I was not. I get that. I was in unfamiliar territory. When I walked into that prison, we were not welcomed as we were in other prisons. There were looks of disgust, like, what's this American doing in our prison? I guess he's going to tell us we should repent, but we're still angry. And if we had the chance, we'd do it all over again. Remember, this prison on the border of the Congo housed those who orchestrated the genocide. Their hatred for the Tutsis were, was intense, and it wasn't dissipating. God opened this door. I went in to preach the gospel. I spent three hours writing the sermon. When I got up on stage to preach, it's like God said, throw that away, I got this. And suddenly all the scriptures, key scriptures I had been reading in my devotional life, all of my life, just started flooding into my mind. And, and it's like the Spirit of God said, open your mouth and the Word of God will come. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no one righteous, no, not one. Come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Confess your sins and God is faithful to forgive you. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, the good news of the gospel. Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock on the door will be open. It's like suddenly for 25 minutes, one scripture after the next, after the next, and then something remarkable happened. Out of these thousands who had orchestrated the genocide, 536 people came forward. The chaplains behind me took center stage. Anastas led them through their confession. There was a huge baptismal service. It was an amazing experience. Some of the prisoners could not believe it as they watched their friends confess their sins, ask for forgiveness. And God said to me during that same time, don't you dare discount this, Pastor Jeff. I'm doing a new thing in Rwanda. Now, because I am skeptical by nature, when we got back to the camp that night, it was me, Anastas Sabamunga, and all the chaplains. And I looked at Anastas and I said, did something supernatural just happen? Or are these guys just trying to get out of prison? In other words, yes, I preach this message, but did they just come forward so they'd be forgiven and somehow think they'd get out of prison and not have to suffer the penalty for their crimes? I could tell that Anastas was not very pleased with me. Anastas looked at me and said, Jeff, they can't get out of prison. It's too late for that. They have to serve their terms, but now they can do so in peace. And he said, Jeff, a real evil took over our country. I thought you understood that. Many of these murderers believe that God abandoned them and let Satan take over their wills. Because in retrospect, they can't believe they were able to commit the atrocities they committed. But today, because of the good news of the gospel, they discovered that God never abandoned them and will indeed forgive them if they confess and repent of their sins. The gospel brought them the hope for which they had been searching. That's what you saw today, Jeff, in that camp. When I returned to the camp, we locked arms. The worship service that night, just by the Congo River, was one of the most intense worship services I've ever been a part of because I realized in that moment, I was part of something much bigger than myself, that God was changing our entire nation. He was bringing restoration in the middle of an event that catalyzed so much retribution. We locked arms and we all began to sing the one song that is universal, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And as we were singing that song, it dawned on me 
that I am no better than those prisoners. That I also am a wretch. That Jesus bravely went into the prisons of the earth. That he rescued the perishing and cared for the dying. That he set the captives free. And now he speaks a word to me, just as he has spoken to those prisoners. The Spirit of God said, well done, good and faithful servant. I felt Jesus that day more than any other day in my life since then. Is it because I did something good? No, because I was part of something good. Is it because I faced death unafraid? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're afraid. You're tempted to, to bail, to leave. But when you obey God, on the other side of the hard word is the best life you could ever imagine. And all of these things came into play at one point. The language of the word, words of the spirit brought to my mind at the right time and the right place to deliver a message that would spark a revival and restoration and repentance. The language of friends. Anastas reminded me that I don't get to choose which commands I obey. Remember, does it matter, Pastor Jeff? Did God tell you to come here or did he not? Did God not open these doors? No man can open these doors into this prison. No man could do that. Are you gonna obey? Or are you going to leave in fear and doubt? The language of obedience. I think now of what I would have missed had I not had the courage to move forward through the encouragement of a friend. And then the language of worship. That night, the words of amazing grace sank deeper into my soul than they had ever been before because I realized we're all sinners in prison in desperate need of the grace of God. How do you know you're pursuing Jesus, can I tell you? You're living more simply. You stopped serving mammon and you began serving God. Somewhere along the line, your focus shifted. Your gaze moved from the things of this world and you fixed your view on God. And as a result, you enjoy the gifts of God, your family, your friends, your community, your church. Your eyes go hard after those things and your worship significantly increases as you lay your mat out metaphorically day after day after day. Can I say to you, God help us all. People keep asking me, Pastor Jeff, is this the end? Are these the end times? And it frustrates me a little every time we have a pandemic or something that happens like an earthquake or some rogue leader wrecks havoc on humanity, every time that happens, it seems that we want to suggest these are the end times. Well, can I tell you, the end times have been happening since Jesus established his kingdom 2,000 years ago. Of course we're in the end times. These are the times of the church. But I can tell you this. This is in America the beginning of secularism. And if you're not careful, please hear me, you will get sucked into this. And the ramifications will be the darkness of your soul. Did you hear me? If you're not careful, you won't even know it. You will get so busy and you will gaze your eyes on things that are the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes. And great will be the darkness in your soul indeed. You've got to make a decision. And that's what this series is about, to change the course and to fix your gaze on the Word of God, on accountability with the people of God, on obeying the hard word God gives you, and worshiping God as the posture of your life. And when you do that, you're on your way to being ready at the Lord's return. And you will experience God in ways for which you have longed so, so long. Father, thank you for reminding us that the passion and pursuit of our lives is Christ. And I pray in this very simple message that somehow we would be reminded we've got to change the way we're living. We've got to ask, what is it in our life that we truly need? And what is it that we want? And what do we need to give up that is distracting from who we truly are in Christ? Renew our passion for your word 
Renew our passion for accountability in community. Renew our passion to obey the word that you give us. And renew our passion for worship, knowing that through these means, we will get to know God. And the God who seems far away will come near. In Christ's name, amen. Ready after the punchers? Come on.
Hey, what an amazing time worshiping together. And now we're going to continue our worship through the giving of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. And you can do that really simply by heading to oneandall.church slash give. And I just want to take a moment and let you know that your generosity is making an impact globally and actually helping people with their tangible needs. Uh, many of you guys know the plight that is happening in Afghanistan right now and the people having to flee. Well, through our partnership with CICM, which is Central India Christian Mission, we've been partnering with them to provide food, clothing, and shelter, and even medicine for a number of Afghan refugees who have crossed over into the border of India. And we're just trying to love on them and care for them in their time of need and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And some of you might also remember that this past fall, we had a large diaper collection. I think we collected around 12,500 diapers. Well, all of those diapers are heading down with our partner, Convoy of Hope, and going to people who are trying to put their life back together after all the tragedy in Louisiana and her canes and all that stuff. So again, thank you. Thank you for being a generous church and thank you for really being the hands and feet of Jesus. And again, if you want to participate, you can head to oneandall.church slash give. But before we head out, just a few quick things now. Number one, community, man. Yeah. We, we talked a lot about it the past few weeks, but if you're not in a community group, you got to get in a community group. That's how you grow. That's yeah. how you grow. Yeah. That's how you grow. And especially in this Pursuing Jesus series, man, get plugged in. You can head to one and all dot church slash community. You can find a group, a time, a space that meets for you. We've got groups in person as well as online. So there is no excuse not to get in a group. Exactly. They're all over the world. I they mean, are. Yeah. And Monday night, don't forget prayer night. Yes. Uh, there's just something special when people come together and pray, come together and worship. We're doing it on all campuses, online. It's gonna be great. You absolutely do not wanna miss prayer night, but something else you don't wanna miss out on is our daily podcast. In fact, it's gonna tag along right with this series with some very special content. And if you didn't know we had a daily podcast, man, we do. And you can download the podcast each and every day. It's called The One and All Daily. In fact, we've seen some record engagement over the past few weeks as a number of one and allers and people all over the world are getting daily inspiration and encouragement as they engage God's word together. So make sure to go to where Ever you download your podcast and subscribe today as we continue to get the word out about what God is doing around these parts as well as all over the world. And lastly, what's happening next Tuesday? Oh, that's right. That's right, Ian. What is happening <laughs> young, next young Tuesday? Young adults. September 14th. Young it's going to be amazing. It's going to be 7 p.m. It's going to be worship, baptism, preaching. It's going to be great. If you're in the area, feel free to come. There's going to be food. But we'd love to see you. Cannot wait. We've been praying a long time about that. So it happens this Tuesday. Make sure to be there. Hey, all that being said, it's time to end like we always end in. And that is with one hope and one life in Christ. God bless you guys.